afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our ethics training this afternoon. We are conducting our one-hour PDH on how shortcuts can kill people and destroy our environment. So I'd like to welcome all of our New Mexico licensed engineers and those of you who carry licenses from all over the United States. We have people from everywhere joining us this afternoon, and I'd like to welcome you once again to our program. This program will fulfill one PDA. New Mexico requires that professional licensed engineers and land surveyors have at least two hours of ethics training every two years. And so we endeavor to make ethics training as interesting and as pertinent as possible for you so that you can really take a look at real life situations. And all of our programs are based on case studies of situations that have occurred in the past uh, in the United States. My name is Bernadette Fedoro and I am the president of Speakers Live. I have been fortunate to work with engineers, scientists, and architects for a great majority of my profession. Although I am neither of those or any of those things professionally, I have a degree in business management and am licensed in business ethics and have been working to help professionals communicate and execute excellent contracts and preserve their integrity and behave in ethical manners so that they can enjoy a long-lasting excellent reputation. So that's just a little bit about me. I have trained organizations and corporations throughout the world. I have been speaking professionally for 26 years and yes I am a certified professional speaker by the National Speakers Association which is the uh, highest designation allowable. You can remember me as Bern Adet and the last name is Vadoro phonetically spelled. We're going to start off talking in part one about oil spills. And what we know about oil spills is that they frequently uh, do devastation to our environment and on occasion have been known to kill people in the process. So here is a graphic courtesy of High Country News that shows some of the largest uh, oil spills in the United States. And this is just from uh, 2010 to 2015. And so this shows a uh, what, what these oil spills, where they occur and uh, the numbers of them. And again, they're just the largest oil spills. Um, since 2010, we know that there have been over 33,300 33, incidents of crude oil and natural gas leaks or ruptures alone in the United States. Our, the industry continues to tell us that they're safe. And what we know is that engineers that work in these fields often are the last to um, be consulted in some of the projects. And we know that you are the ones that ultimately have the solutions to uh, preserve our environment and protect people. And so this is a, a crucial area for us to begin looking at. So the first part of this program is very visual. I have actual pictures of slides, uh, courtesy of various organizations that we can begin looking uh, at. Uh, here's a recent one from last month, um, September 9th, 2016. There was uh, 340,000 gallons of gas spilled in central Alabama. Uh, the governors in six surrounding states declared an emergency, and it wasn't necessarily about protecting the environment or the people, but the emergency was the concern about how the consumers of their states would be able to get their gas and oil needs met because the pipelines had to be shut down in this particular situation that occurred. We're going to move on to another uh, example. Uh, January 6th of 2015, uh, there was a ruptured pipeline that leaked 3 million gallons of brine into two creeks near Will Williston, uh, North Dakota. And brine is a toxic mix. Uh, it is uh, much, much, much saltier than ocean water. It is laced with heavy metals and fracking chemicals, and it contains uh, so, um, contaminants that uh, poison our soil, uh, vegetation, kills aquatic life, and it has been extremely uh, threatening to our environment and people's health. Um, 
The, uh, there was a case study done by Duke University that showed a wastewater spill had caused uh, widespread water and soil con uh, contamination a year later when they came in to do the actual study. Um, we know that uh, Chemical and Engineering News said this year that toxic chemicals from fracking, wastewater spills can persist for years. And North Dakota, they've had a huge boom, and as a result of the boom, the uh, the safety uh, strategies have not been as as diligent as we would like to see. And that creates a huge ethical concern for most of us. We, we recognize that, um, that we have the technology today to be able to, uh, to pull oil out of the ground and, and harvest, but we have to really put an enormous amount of care and protection in the way that we do that. So we'll continue looking at some of the spills that have occurred just recently again. Uh, Plains All-American Pipeline Oil Spill in Santa Barbara, California. This is an actual picture from May 20th, uh, um, May 2015, and this is a photo courtesy of Associated Press, that shows the beaches that were just completely uh, filled with uh, waste oil, uh, leaking crude that came out of the pipes. And this was an interesting case because the uh, All-American uh, Pipeline actually heard the alarm go off in their Texas offices, and they shut off the alarm. We don't know why the case records have been sealed, but the initial investigation showed that the alarm system did work, it did go off, and the employees that were sent to look or were not alerted to go look at to find out what was going on. How the company became alerted to this particular oil spill is because of the stench of the oil that was spilling from ravines onto Refugio uh, State Beach, which was a very pristine and popular park for swimming and camping. So there is no automatic shutoff valves, which is, presents a huge problem for many of these oil um, dispensing pipelines. And when alarms, I don't know if they're getting a lot of false alarms or why they would shut off the alarm and not immediately have people on the ground to investigate to see what is going on. What we do know about the Plains All-American Pipeline is that they did report $43 billion of revenue in 2014, just the year before this particular incident, and $878 million in profit. We also also know that this particular company has rates of incidents that are three times the national average. Uh, the company had been cited for 175 violations involving pipeline corrosion, operator error, pump failure, and equipment malfunction. Uh, their incidents caused more than $23 million in property damage and spilled more than 688,000 gallons of hazardous waste, according to federal records. So this particular company, the Plains All-American Pipeline, is the fifth worst company out of 1,700 pipeline operators. And so we see that the public has become very skeptical about safe piping of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels across our country. And this is part of the problem, is that these, uh, these constant reports from around the nation. Um, ExxonMobil, and uh, on January 17th, uh, 2015, had a, a pipeline rupture uh, in Yellowstone River, and it dumped 50,000 gallons of crude oil. Uh, they are still recovering <laughs> from a, a crude gusher that went into the Yellowstone River back in July 1st of 2011, when 63,000 gallons of crude gushed into the Yellowstone River. So again, these rivers feed the natural habitat. They're, uh, they're important for wildlife. They're important to the people that uh, rely on the water for, for camping and for uh, survival of individuals. 
Now we all know about one of the worst oil leaks, uh, uh, and that was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in uh, 20, um, the 20th of April, 2010, and it spewed until uh, September 19th of 2010, and it was considered the worst, uh, one of the worst oil spills in the United States. And this is a picture uh, that NASA took of the oil spill on May 20th, and this is from outer space. And all of this glistening is from the oil spill and the uh, contaminants that they put in the water to try, to try to break down the oil, which actually indicated by many environmentalists was indicated to make the, in, um, the catastrophe even worse than, it, than the oil itself, um, the pollutants that were put in the water to break up the oil were considered uh, worse than that. So I have a question for all of you watching and listening. Uh, the congressional report that uh, was finalized after they reviewed the all of the circumstances surrounding the BP Gulf oil spill, what did the congressional report show? Did they say that the main reason for the BP spill was, number one, that BP and its partners were responsible uh, for the spill because they had made decisions to uh, institute a series of cost-cutting decisions and they had a lack of well safety controls. Do you think that was the primary reason for this spill? Or do you believe that the reason for this spill was because there was too much government red tape. That's number two. Um, answer number three is, do you think that the primary reason be, is, was because of uh, seawater warming temperatures causing instabil instability? Or do you think it was because of number four, the lack of trained personnel? The number one reason was that BP and its partners had decided to institute cost-cutting decisions, and they failed to ensure that there was well safety controls. And so this, in many people's mind's eye, is almost a criminal offense. Now, the only silver lining in this particular case is the fact that BP is one of the richest corporations in the world and they had deep pockets to help pay back the billions upon billions of dollars that were required for cleaning up uh, much of the mess in the Gulf. We're going to go now to part two and part two we're going to talk about methane leaks. Now methane is a supercharged global warming pollutant that is 87 times more potent than carbon dioxide over a 20-year scale. And this here uh, is the Four Corners area in New Mexico. It's in the Farmington area of New Mexico, if you're looking on your slides. And this basically is where we'll see it in just a little bit, where there was uh, a huge issue that occurred um, most recently. But let's move to our next slide as we talk about the Aliso Canyon leak. Aliso Canyon is a prestigious community in Southern California. It is in the foothills of Los Angeles where people that have a little bit of money live and enjoy their life, the sunshine state of California. In 2015, last year, um, Porter Ranch, California, which is a part of this community, uh, there is a company called Southern California Gas, and they have a large uh, storage facility. That storage facility began leaking methane at a rate of more than 66,500 pounds per hour. This is an, a huge amount of methane, and the dangerous thing about methane is that you can't see it. Sometimes you can't even smell it. Uh, but the nearby residents and employees of SoCal Gas were complaining of headaches, dizziness, and nausea. The um, SoCal uh, Gas ended up with the responsibility of recognizing that two schools 
uh, nearby were closed, and the company paid to relocate 2,500 families as a result of this leak. It leaked from October, and that's when, you know, there was major issues going on in the community, lots of people complaining. So it probably began before then, but that's when they began to recognize what was going on um, and put, put their finger on, oh, we've got a problem here. Uh, so it was all of uh, the rest of October, you know, just a little bit uh, uh, less than a year ago or a little bit more than a year ago, uh, November, December. December, January, and they finally contained the leak in February. So for almost four months, an enormous amount of gas was leaked. And according to environmentalists, this was the worst single natural uh, gas leak in the history of the United States. And in terms of the environmental impact, this is a picture using infrared of what was coming out, and you couldn't see it to the uh, uh, the uh, the, the, the eye. Uh, this was a worse environmental impact. It had way more uh, implications than the Gulf oil spill in terms of the devastation that it did to the environment and, and its impact to climate change. Studies show over and over again conclusively that oil and gas industries are the largest industrial source of methane pollution, releasing 33% of all methane emissions in 2014 in the United States. And you're wondering where does where's the other uh, portion come from? It's cows. So we, we, we didn't have time to deal with that piece today, but this is a piece that in that engineers can begin working on and looking at, and you are the ones that ultimately the responsibility goes back to for our, our society and well-being for fixing these kinds of problems. We talked about the Four Corners area, and this came to New Mexico's attention in 2014 when the Europeans were sending us pictures of slides, and there were hot spots, and this was one of the hottest spots in the entire world emanating this huge plume of methane over the sand basin um, area, which of course is the Four Corners, uh, uh, all of the uh, natural gas th that goes on there. And what happened is that organizations from all over the country descended upon New Mexico to try to find out what was going on with this methane mystery. They called it a methane mystery. And so we had University of Michigan, we had NOAA, we had uh, all kinds of research organizations here at NASA, and what they discovered was this is a result of industrial gas being burned off and being refined and uh, being prepared for uh, transport across uh, to the, uh, and this is a privately owned uh, company that is uh, using, um, you know, the gas in the area. And, and of course, I always am concerned about people in the immediate area that is home, the San Juan uh, base is also, basin is home to the Navajo Nation, which is one of the largest uh, indigenous Native American nations in the country live in that immediate area as well. And they have complained for decades of problems of pollution with their complaints basically ignored for the most part. The second hot spot in New Mexico was coming from the Permian base, and peer-reviewed studies published by the National uh, Academy of Sciences say the, the methane emissions are at least 90% higher than the government estimates. Uh, that, in other words, when they begin a, 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 refining the fuel in these particular areas, the estimates were far lower than what the actual reality of the off gases are tending to be. So what we see from EPA in 2014 is that San Juan Basin in the uh, northern part of our state, in the Permian Basin uh, in the southern part of the state, are ranked as the third and fourth most methane polluted regions in the country. And so we need to take a look at this when we are looking at the ethical considerations of what happens when we are dealing with the environment.
Um, almost every day you can find somewhere in America that there has been a gas line explosion, January 9th, 2016. Uh, it was just reported kind of, you know, no one was injured, thank goodness no one was hurt, but there was a gas line explosion in uh, uh, near Franklin, Texas. You see the cows in the background. Uh, neighbors hear this huge um, explosion. They come outside. They take pictures. Later on, they discuss that it was a, a gas line explosion. And we'll talk about why this happens in just a little bit. Uh, another example uh, in West Virginia, ethane pipeline explosion. Um, and uh, it was part of a, a pipeline, a 1,200-mile pipeline from the Appalachia to Texas Express um, from the Marcellus Shell in Washington. So a big pipeline, and it exploded. And when communities, when there is a chance that it affects the water, what we see is this kind of, of uh, resistance. And this is actually a website in Virginia where community members are pulling together, you know, plant corn, not pipeline, save our water and air, uh, very active, uh, very vocal. They look for contributions and they're, you know, fighting back uh, against these kinds of pollutions that can affect the water of these areas for decades to come uh, and is extremely expensive to clean up. So if we can do the safety on the front end, you know, it's a pound uh, of prevention is, is worth, uh, you know, a ton of, of cleanup at the end of the, the day. These are the hotspot flares from 2012, looking at them nationally, and of course these are all adding to climate change. This is uh, gas that gets caught up in our atmosphere, and uh, you know it just it, it's a huge issue that we as engineers and scientists and um, architects have to look at. Uh, there's a, another example of a pipeline explosion in San Bruno, San Francisco, uh, killing people and injuring others. Uh, the uh, utility company ended up um, being fined 1.6 billion. But we must remember that many of these uh, oil and gas companies make billions and billions of dollars in profits for their shareholders every year. And we have to reconcile what the profit motive is against what the injury for life can be. Uh, another example here in southern New Mexico uh, in recent memory is the uh, in the Carlsbad area where we had an explosion and people were killed and others injured. Uh, campers in New Mexico, uh, this was the El Paso natural gas where uh, five people were killed and uh, um, ten people were killed actually in this. And again, the cause of so many of these accidents are old corroded pipes. So these pipelines are miles and miles long and they have to be maintained. We have to get controls into these pipes so that we can measure flow and immediately have shut off valves so that when there is an, uh, an explosion or a problem that, that we stamp out and minimize the damage as quickly as possible. So I'm just going to show you very quickly the part three, the fossil fuel spills from 2015. And this is, uh, again, they're all over the country. They don't get reported. Uh, uh, you know, if they can clean them up themselves, many of them are not, don't hit the news. We don't hear about them. But there's the William, Williston uh, one that we talked about earlier, uh, Jackson, uh, Mississippi. Uh, there was a, an incident there um, in Montana. This is the one we talked about earlier. Again, the you know they were still cleaning up from the 2011 spill. Uh, we have uh, events in North Dakota, West Virginia, Iowa. Another one in West Virginia, these having to do with uh, cars carrying crude oil, getting derailed, uh, fireballs, uh, you know, exploding in the air, and then governors calling uh, emergency for counties. And what this means for everyone often is that the taxpayers end up picking up the tab for the emergency cleanup. Uh, NOAA and all of these other agencies paying overtime, uh, having volunteers come in. Uh, you know, having to bring in water. Uh, what we know about this is that many of these communities are now forced to drink uh, bottled water 
or uh, boil their water before using it. Another example in Illinois, Houston, Texas. Uh, this was an interesting case in Houston, Texas, where um, ships collided in a channel, and a Danish tanker was carrying 216,000 barrels of gasoline or, you know, MTB. Uh, MTB has been banned in the United States uh, since 2005. And what happens often with these companies is they will quickly settle, uh, you know, maybe even billions of dollars and ask that the papers related to the incident be um, sealed. So they become sealed for 50 years or under a certain amount of time, and they just re try to resolve this problem as quickly as possible. So, you know, who knows what the Houston uh, ship canal looks like, but I wouldn't want anybody to drink anything from there. Uh, North Dakota, Arlington, Texas, Fresno, California, again, fracking fluid, brine, uh, natural gas explosions, uh, more in North Dakota. Um, this is the one that we talked about. It had different names. Uh, here it's referred to as the Golota or Golota, California. This is that uh, all-American pipe that we talked about earlier, and we saw the pictures of the um, the leak into the ocean. Uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, Louisiana. This is just 2015. Again, Illinois, Montana, uh, Missouri, uh, uh, South Dakota. And you will have copies of the slides so that you can see this. This is the Porter Ranch that we talked about earlier. Uh, Brownsville, uh, 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 Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, derailments, um, another Wisconsin. And I wasn't included in Canada. A lot of these, you know, there's a few that are occurring in Canada as well, but I just wanted to focus on the U.S. since I don't have engineers from uh, outside of the country uh, watching or being required to take ethics training. Um, so rail yard um, and then December 1st, the final one in North Dakota, another brine accident. So according to the EPA, they say that there's an estimated 14 thousand spills each year, but they say that many of them are small enough to be cleaned up by the company themselves and not necessarily reported or widespread alarm about those. But if you calculate the amount of, of gas, oil, spills that we are putting into our water, our air, uh, and into the soil, it becomes quite concerning to most people. Uh, state regulators in lots of, of communities around the country are concerned as they began to link the contamination of drinking water to drilling activities. Uh, authorities in Texas have been very concerned about their um, their air, the admissions that are coming up from the refineries that are used to produce uh, the fossil fuels. Um, so what we know is that these incidents, uh, many of these explosions have killed people, they've injured others, they've destroyed natural habitats, birds, fish, and wildlife, and toxic pollution does flood into the oil, uh, into our soil, water, and air. The costs are billions in damages and more billions to reclaim the environment, the air, and the water. And sometimes we ask when people are talking about jobs, what I would like to call our engineers upon is to really uh, pull together to come up with solutions to avoid the toxicity that is occurring. Uh, I know that we can come up with solutions. So what is going on is that um, go in the opposite direction here, is that the biggest concern is aging pipes. Uh, half of America's crude oil pipelines are more than 50 years old, and those are increasingly uh, subjected to uh, chances of, of corrosion and failure. Um, there's human error. If your pipelines aren't clearly uh, marked, there have been some of the explosions that uh, there was one that occurred, I believe, one or two that occurred because of human error of uh, construction going on where machinery hit a pipe and caused an explosion and people died in that process. Um, 
we need alert systems that very quickly let us know when there is a pipeline leak so that there is a, an immediate shutoff system and that we can act quickly in these instances rather than waiting days, months, uh, and even years. According to some experts, there is still leakage coming from the Deep Horizon uh, water uh, oil spill in the Gulf, that there are experts that say there's still leakage coming from that. So that becomes very tragic. Uh, there are no safety provisions in many of these areas where the pipelines are laid against natural phenomena like lightning, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes. We, if we're going to use fossil fuels, we have to ensure the American people that we are doing it in the safest way possible. And companies consistently fail to prevent the corrosion. Here's one example of a company doing um, reclaiming pipelines. So again, they're insulating it and they are you know, putting a, a foam activation around it, and then they're also using a stainless steel, uh, longer-lasting pipe to uh, to control those kinds of, of problems and issues. Uh, better pipelines, flow meters, shutoff switches, leak detection, more inspectors, and higher penalties. Those are all answers to this particular problem. We're going to move into part four now as we talk about shortcuts that kill. We're going to start with the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. In 1972, uh, what we know that was that um, codes, fire codes, called for fire sprinklers throughout casinos. But an exception was sought for the main floor of the MGM Grand because they said that the casino and the deli were going to be open 24 hours, and if a fire broke out, it would be quickly contained. Well, shortly after they opened, uh, a fire occurred in the deli and was unnoticed. Uh, there was flawed electrical wiring and installation throughout the casino, and the casino had been made with 12 tons of highly inflammable glue on the floor level of the casino ceilings. So between the flawed air control system, air was pushed up and carbon monoxide actually rose to the highest levels of the guest rooms in the casino. So this is eight years after the casino was built. Um, the fire took place on November 21st, 1980, and the fire and smoke spread rapidly throughout the main floor into the upper floors. 85 people died, mostly from smoke and fume inhalation, and uh, there were millions of dollars in settlements um, for the damages that occurred. Uh, 700 people uh, were injured as a result of the fire, and what the inspectors said were that it could have been simply resolved had sprinklers been installed in the deli uh, and in the serving area. There would have been a very, very high probability that the fire would have been greatly contained. Carl Lowe, a fire safety inspector, reported that the MGM Grand put their financial concerns above safety concerns. And we see that often, is that people will put, you know, let's cut a corner here, maybe we can save some costs there, and then we end up with some disastrous results. So it's crucially important that we always stay on the side of protecting people, protecting our environment, and doing the ethical thing, even if it costs us a little bit more. It's always worth it in the long run. What we see um, as a result of these disasters time after time is that the cleanup effort, the settlement effort, is becomes much more expensive than, again, that, that just that little, um, you know, prevention that we could have to begin with. We're going to talk about Deutsche um, Bank uh, in New York, where there was fraud, corruption, and disaster. This was a uh, building in 20, uh, 2007, August of 2007, and the building was to be demolished. And um, 
the contractor, the, the, you know, everybody was involved, as is the case in many of these cases. We see that it's not just the company itself, but we see it's often the regulators who turn a blind eye to what is going on. It's, it's government officials who rubber stamp plans. So you, it, it's not just one individual. It's often many people that are complicit in the problems. But in this particular case, we had uh, smokers, uh, workers who were smoking on the 17th floor in violation of safety code. Um, in addition, there were huge amounts of plywood sheeting that had been used. This demolition was dealing with asbestos and um, so they were trying to do uh, a demolition and, you know, it, we all know if we've been involved in abatement, it's a tricky uh, situation to maintain that there is not cross-contamination of these uh, pollutants. And they had many heavy metals inside the contaminated buildings. So what happened is they put up a protective uh, a maze of polyethylene sheets throughout the uh, the, the building so that they could make sure that the, the asbestos didn't move from one area to the other. So while the crews were removing asbestos, the fire spread in both directions, affecting a total of 10 floors. The building lacked a standpipe, which is standard in most businesses or uh, in the construction of most buildings, making the firefighting extremely difficult. The fire burned into the night before being extinguished and two New York firefighters died of smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning. 115 firefighters were injured and an enormous amount of toxic fuel was released into the environment. The contractor involved was Bobus, who was uh, found guilty of uh, being involved in a overtime scheme uh, when they were contracted to demolish the bank tower. Their workers were padding hours, taking vacation time, uh, all of these in unscrupulous practices in order to increase the amount of the contract. Uh, the building itself was riddled with workplace violations that uh, normally don't take place when you're doing a demolition. Um, the crews were moving at a glacial pace, just removing one floor at a time. And ultimately what was discovered was that uh, Bovis uh, Lend-Lease, who had been up to the time one of the biggest contractors, ended up admitting to routinely inflating bills on New York uh, City projects for years, thus ripping off taxpayers and developers. Uh, three people were indicted in this particular case, and they ultimately were not found guilty. There were so many different culprits involved in this. Again, uh, city development officials, uh, permit, permit planning, uh, you know, the engineers at different levels, inspectors, along with the contractor. The company did agree to pay $50 million in fines and restitution for scamming uh, work at, at City uh, Field, the, the Grand Central Terminal, American Museum of Natural History, and many other profile high cases. So again, those three employees were indicted, yet no one was ever convicted. We're going to move to a couple of case studies, and if you were in last week's program, we were looking at these case studies from the vantage point of the engineers and their reputations. I'd like to look at them from another vantage point about how they uh, harmed the environment and killed people. So we're going to start with a case, the case with uh, Flint, Wa Michigan Water. And just a little bit of background to bring you up to speed on this particular case. Uh, 
since 2010, there have been nine cities, 51 municipalities, and 38 utilities that filed bankruptcy. Flint, Michigan being one of those uh, municipalities that filed bankruptcy. And so this broke city was looking to reduce costs. Um, the Flint water crisis is, is said to have been an unintended consequences of the state of Michigan to take over Flint in 2011. When Flint could not pay its own bills, the state of Michigan began uh, the fiduciary responsibility of managing the, uh, the bills and the, the income for the city of Flint. And uh, one of the things that the governor of Flint instituted when they went into this emergency situation was to put in place these emergency managers. And these managers were unelected, but they had total uh, responsibility and authority for the decision making of the city of Flint. And I'd like for you to think about uh, the city of Flint, which we'll look at in just a moment, a very, very poor city with a large minority population. If this had been the city of Ann Arbor, would things have been different? So they were looking at cost-cutting uh, explorations, and one of the things that they were looking at was how they might be able to save some money by switching their water system from the Detroit Water and Sewer Department, who had been providing uh, water for them for many, many years. And the city and state decided that they could build their own water pipeline uh, to the KW uh, Water Authority, and that they would be able to save $200 million over 25 years. And so they hired a number of engineering firms to help them make this decision. And one of the engineering firms was Lockwood, Andrews, and Noonan Land, uh, a Houston-based engineering firm. Uh, they were brought in to weigh the options. And again, I, I brought up this uh, question because when I was looking at the problem, here's Flint and here's Ann Arbor. And you know, here's Detroit and here's where they were getting their water from. And, uh, and so this is just an interesting case uh, in terms of, of the population that uh, the water was serving. A little bit about land. They are nationally known. They have an excellent reputation. Um, and they consulted with Flint, and they told Flint basically that uh, using the water from the Flint River was doable. And they said that their, in their pre preliminary analysis indicated that the water from the river could be used, uh, and, but it must be treated to meet regulations. And I always say that people don't seem to read or understand the verbiage. So in last week's uh, program, I had this particular slide. What the words that were put in there didn't say as clearly, and you'll see them in just a minute, but basically when I read them, I understood that it meant, yes, we can get the water temporarily from Flint River, but it's going to cost us more money right now than it would for us to continue getting our water from the Detroit Water and Sewer Department. That was very clear to me. So here's the slide, uh, and, and what's so interesting to me is that the original verbiage came from um, a, an engineering firm, a row engineering firm, in 2011, and they said the preliminary analysis indicates that water from the river, that's the Flint River, can be treated to meet current regulations. However, there's the big caveat there, however, additional treatment will be required than for Lake Huron water. Now, that's the Detroit water. That's where the water comes from, from Detroit. So maybe people were confused. They weren't reading between the lines. What happened was when they brought lands in in 2014, uh, they basically paid $900,000 for the study as part of a $4 million contract to help them, that's the city of Flint, to prepare the drinking water so that they could uh, continue and save a little bit of money. Now, 
what I understand from my investigation and the work that we've done here was that lands really needed more like $9 million to be able to do the contract. And the city was trying to do it on the cheap. And people who really knew nothing about water, water treatment, they were not engineers, and those engineers for the state of uh, Flint were criminally involved, and you'll see in a little bit how they were charged uh, criminally uh, for their uh, not only standing up for the people of Flint, but for uh, being uh, foolish, uh, you know, just lying, straight out lying about what was going on in the water. So they, either they were grossly incompetent, didn't know what was going on, or were paid by somebody else to to lie to the people of Flint. But they, uh, the city uh, continued to ignore the recommendations from the contracted engineers, and that would have been Lands and uh, uh, Veolia and some of the other engineer companies that were brought in on contract, and the city wanted to do it, the state wanted to do it as inexpensively as possible. And it was really the state's mandate with their emergency managers. Uh, the city councilors continued to, to um, advocate for the city, uh, the residents of the city. So in a April 2014, Flint begins to get its drinking water uh, after 47 years of buying it from Detroit. They began getting it uh, from the Flint River as a temporary fix until the pipeline to the KWA authority is completed. And here's where uh, the state really becomes complicit, and that is the uh, professional engineer uh, Michael Prisby, who is a PE and with the Department of Environmental Quality, tells Flint uh, citizens and residents that the quality of the water being put out, this is a direct quote, meets all of our drinking water standards and that Flint water is safe to drink. Now what's interesting is that immediately this large minority, poor city, um, where 40% of the residents live in poverty and the majority are African Americans, began to immediately complain. The coloration of the water, the smell of the water, they began to say that it is foul smelling, it's tainted, uh, residents are starting to get uh, hair loss, rashes began, and you know, these are all actual pictures in this slide of, of things that are coming up with the babies, the women, the, you know, the men from washing, soaking in the, this tainted water. So the switch was made April of 2014, and these are the complaints that are coming forth May, June, and July. And the um, city officials that are, you know, are screaming to the state, the state is insisting that the water is safe to drink, that it's fine. Uh, in August and September, uh, people began taking samples out, and the public service information that is, uh, that, uh, is being spread from the state to the community is that if you're going to do a water sample, make sure you let your water run a certain amount of time, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but E. coli and other bacteria are found in the Flint water supply. So in August and September, remember, they changed over in April. So this is now six, you know, it's, what do you have, April, May, June, July, August, September, five months later, they're telling residents to boil the water before drinking it. Um, so in October of 2014, General Motors actually gets uh, permission from the emergency management uh, manager, Darnell Early, to disconnect from Flint and go back to Detroit water because they say that Flint water is corroding their engines. And the um, uh, Earl Early, the, the appointee by uh, Rick Snyder, the, the uh, governor of Michigan gives them immediate 
uh, allowance to go back. And the union, the head of the union there, Dan Reyes, one of the union presidents, starts uh, screaming and making public comments that if this water is too corrosive for an engine, what's it doing to the inside of a person? So you know, people are starting to get quite concerned. Uh, in January of 2015, now we're you know moving along here. Uh, the, uh, the Detroit water system offers offers to reconnect Flint to its water system at no cost. The Flint emergency manager, Darnell Early, rejects the offer. And, and again, they what they do instead is they hire a company to in February of 2015 to study the water's quality issues after um, there's been high disinfectant products, byproducts, uh, that are now causing the safe uh, violations to the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, so they tell them, we want you to test for everything, but don't test for heavy metals or lead. So that's what Viola says that their mission is, is to go in and test for everything other than heavy metals and lead. And um, we'll see what their results are in just a moment. But in the meantime, hospitals are doing work on children that are coming in with uh, behavioral problems. And they find that Flint children under the age of five, when they do the blood work, are having lead levels two to three times higher than the average. In February, Time magazine features on the cover of its magazine the poisoning and poisoning of an American city. And the doctors discover that um, these two-year-old babies are covered with rash from chemicals dumped into the Flint's water system to deal with the bacteria that is causing problems, uh, but, uh, or, and, you know, lead, leaded problems, and they're just making one matter worse than the other. And in March 2015, the next month, Veolia comes up with its report, and they say that the water quality is needing state and federal regulations. Now, this is what's getting them into trouble with legal uh, 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 litigation right now is because they've produced these statements that were widely used to convince people in Flint that the water was safe and that they could continue using the water when in fact it was uh, still filled with all kinds of stuff. In the meantime, Legionnaire's disease breaks out resulting in 12 deaths from 2015 to 20, uh, uh, in 2014, and in 2015, 80 people get sick, and even up to 2016, eight people die from uh, Legionnaire's disease. Uh, in the meantime, try halo methanes. You engineers probably can say that better than I can. Uh, these horrible chemical co oh, compounds that are highly carcinogenic are being found in the water um, as a result of um, you know, the disinfectant that has been put in the water. And what they find is they're combating all of these different issues, and this is what the pipes are looking like. They are causing huge amount of corrosion because they're increasing the acidity in the water to try to combat some of the, the uh, bacteria in the water. In the meantime, lead poisoning, that is extremely har harmful to children and pregnant women causing learning disability, behavioral problems, problems and mental retardation is, uh, is, is greatly increased in the water of Flint residents. Uh, in the meantime, Flint residents are continued by the government, the state government, uh, they continue to be told that they can drink the water, cook, and bathe in the water, uh, the state officials insisting that the water is indeed safe. Um, so today what we're looking at as lawsuits against the engineering companies who put forth statements saying that the water was safe to drink. Uh, and the engineering companies fighting back saying, look, we were told to just limit our studies to, uh, you know, the, the bacterial kinds of problems. The other kind of problems that is that the state may have um, infected the studies by bringing the water samples over. There's all kinds of mischief 
uh, that has occurred in this particular situation, and we don't know, you know, what's what's up and what's down. But these are examples of what the waters look like, the Detroit water and the Flint water. And uh, both of these engineering companies have been accused of professional negligence and a pu uh, public nuisance. They both receive money, and Veolia is being accused of fraud. This is what it, the water looked like. People took pictures of what the water was looking like, and this is corrosion coming out of the water, uh, you know, the brown contaminated water that the city was insisting that they um, drink. Uh, and again, they said, hey, we, you know, we weren't asked to, to uh, look at lead and copper. It wasn't part of our scoping. We're not to blame. Um, and uh, the attorney general, you know, is looking for a scapegoat. The attorney general you know, uh, it needs to look internally as well, but they're putting uh, private sector engineering companies on the firing line. And the issue here is that whether they're guilty or not, there is a public perception that they were hired to safeguard the company, the um, the water integrity in Flint. And so we have to be very, very careful when we're involved in these situations that we uh, follow steps to protect our reputations as well. Well, if you actually go to the uh, page, home page of lands, they have a whole uh, uh, timeline of their involvement with the Flint tragedy. Uh, one of the issues that is concerning for me is that there's a lot of handwritten notes. Uh, those could, you know, uh, those would probably be thrown out to a jury because who knows when the notes were written. There's no validation that those notes were received by Flint officials, by city or state officials. We know that uh, a couple of uh, state employees have been charged with felonies, uh, engineers, professional engineers, Michael Glasgow, uh, Stephen Bush, uh, Michael Prisby, all uh, charged with um, with felonies. But the community of Flint continued to drink contaminated water uh, to 20, uh, up through October 2015. And the governor uh, issuing statements in 2015 saying that the water was safe and then later saying that he was relying on falsified reports by the, his own Department of Environmental Quality. Um, we know that that acidity caused the, the, the leaching of the pipes and increasing the lead uh, in, in the homes. And, and here's the statement of October 2nd directly from the governor of Michigan telling people that the water is safe. When in November of 2015, I guess that's when actually they announced that they could go back to the Detroit water and the transition takes place is in November of 2015. Uh, the three schools that are monitoring lead uh, in the water show high, high levels and that's when the the governor of the state finally allowed the city to go back. Uh, we see that uh, engine, uh, an, a professional engineering firm, a professor at Virginia Tech, came with students and helped break this case by looking at river water and saying that it uh, wasn't treated uh, properly. Had they added phosphate, uh, the phosphates to deal with the corrosion, they might have been able to, but they had an untreated uh, problem. And I never know how long our cases are going to take, but I think I have held you hostage for a good hour here, close to. You will be receiving two things very shortly. You will be receiving your evaluation for the program along with a few questions to satisfy your uh, accreditation of the one-hour PDH. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.